Okay. You guys all set? You ready to go? Fantastic. Okay. Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome everyone to the uh, second event in the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine conversation series on accessibility and inclusion in STEM. Uh, I'm Dr. Rory Cooper and I'm chair of, the, of our planning committee. And I appreciate you joining us today. Uh, this conversation in this is the second in a series of five conversations. Um, we hope that you were able to watch the pre-recorded keynote lectures and by our, uh, by our speakers before attending today's live meeting. However, they will they are posted online and you can view them after the event. Um, we're very happy for the two excellent presentations that were provided, and I'm sure that you will enjoy learning from them. Our goal is that this event will offer the opportunity for active discussion among the speakers, panelists, and those of you who are listening via Slido. Uh, for those of you viewing via Slido, you can ask questions in the Q&A section of the website, and we will consolidate your questions and bring them into the discussion. Before we get started with our program, I'd like to introduce each of the members of our planning committee. Um, so, I first like to call on Dr. Emily Ackerman to introduce herself. Hello, uh, my name is Emily Ackerman. I am a postdoctoral researcher at Harvard Medical School. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and thank you for coming today. Thank you, Emily. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Cheryl Bergstaller. Cheryl. Oops. All right, um, then we'll move on to uh, Dr. Julian Brinkley. Hello everyone, uh, Dr. Julian Brinkley, Assistant Professor of Human Centered Computing uh, at Clemson University and the Director of the Drive Lab. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm a uh, uh, early 40s black male with a beard. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Uh, Dr. Chris Atchison. Good morning, folks. Chris Atchison, uh, professor of geoscience education at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, white male, no hair, beard, glasses, and a big smile. Good to see you all. Uh, Dr. Carolyn Solomon. Yes, hello. I'm a professor in the biology department. I am also the director of School of Science, Technology, and Accessibility in Mathematics and Public Health. We like to say that we make a stamp on our students' futures here. I use pronouns she, her, and hers. And my background is a wall with a globe sitting to my right, and I am wearing a red shirt. I identify as a woman, and thank you all so much for joining our conversation today. Great. Thank you, Carolyn. I should say I'm Rory Cooper. I'm a white male, uh, early 60s, a veteran of the United States Army, spot of wheelchair user, and um, I use the he, him pronouns. And I, in my background is a, uh, is a bookshelf with various knickknacks on it. Well, thank you. Um, so at this point, I'm going to turn over the moderating to Carolyn Solomon, who will be our moderator for today's discussion on accessibility inclusion in STEM in the context of laboratory-based research and education. Thank you, Carolyn. Yeah, before we get into our conversation today and introduce our presenters and keynote speakers, I wanted to give the opportunity to give a brief overview of today's highlights and their presentations. 
And I wanted to also invite the public in this opportunity. So we wanted to go ahead and give the opportunity for you guys to go ahead and watch our pre-recorded conversations before we get into the discussion today. But if you weren't able to watch the pre-recorded conversations, they are posted online and available for your later viewing. We do have some keynote speakers for this event today. First, I'd like to introduce Brad. He practices in, at the Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering and the School of in, Industrial Engineering at Purdue University. So first, if you'd like to go ahead and, and introduce yourself, Brad, and get started. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, I'm Brad Durstock. I'm a professor of practice at uh, Purdue University. Uh, I use the pronouns he, his, him. I'm a white male and a tetraplegic wheelchair user due to a spinal cord injury. Um, in my full presentation, I mentioned some strategies for increasing accessibility and productivity in the biomedical lab environment. I also discussed why being able to actively participate in biomedical labs is imperative for promoting the inclusion of people with disabilities in STEM fields. Um, traditional biomedical or wet labs are pervasive throughout secondary and post-secondary educational institutions and research centers. Um, these are really the, the forges in which scientists and engineers in the life sciences are created. Uh, the whole pedagogy of the life sciences and medicine are really founded on the principles of activity-based learning and providing students practical or hands-on lab experiences. Too often the focus of ADA compliance in the past has been really providing students with disabilities access to labs but not to be active participants. Thus, there's a lot of uh, barriers uh, to people with disabilities from achieving a ultimate career in STEM. Uh, we believe that by enabling students with disabilities to be as independent as possible, it is important to be a successful in undergraduate STEM education and very critical to postgraduate education in conducting research and being skilled in the medical arts. Um, we acknowledge that there is a need for multiple strategies though uh, to help students with disabilities to be successful in the lab sciences, uh, including universal design features in laboratories and developing accessible lab equipment. There is also a need to improve the training of instructors and TAs who are at the forefront of teaching uh, new students with disabilities to be proficient in lab activities and not to be discouraged from entering STEM. Um, there needs to be a better definition of what lab assistants are needed for students and what their roles are. Um, Virtual lab training has its place as well. And um, critical, I think, also is to provide students as many uh, other training uh, options, opportunities, such as internships. Um, but beyond that, I think there also needs to be a reevaluation of what qualifies as being successful in STEM um, to ultimately uh, achieve a career as a scientist or engineer. There are other barriers to inclusion, such as timelines that are expected in order to graduate or reach tenure, um, attitudes toward people with disabilities being in STEM, necessary funding support mechanisms, and uh, just other support, such as mentoring and uh, other activities that many able-bodied students might uh, benefit from, but 
are not available to those with disabilities. So greater inclusion really improves conditions for everything. It's a rising tide that lifts all boats. Better human factors and lab accessibility, increases efficiency, decreases repetitive motion, stresses. Uh, the input of people uh, with disabilities leads to diversity of thought, insights in a lot of different disciplines uh, in STEM, new perspectives in terms of healthcare, medicine, human computer interaction, and other engineering fields. So I think I'll stop there so we can engage others in this discussion. But um, I, I want to first really uh, thank the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, and this program for giving this opportunity to speak. And thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Brad. I'd now like to go ahead and introduce our second keynote speaker, Dr. Teresa Edelman. Dr. Edelman earned her PhD from the University of Minnesota in the Molecular Cellular Development Biology and Genetics Program. She is currently co-PI of S-STEM, which, which is scholarships, scholarships in STEM. STEM. She's also involved in a mentorship program and biology instructor at Minneapolis Technical and Community College. If you'd like to go ahead, Teresa. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, my name is Teresa Edelman. I use she, her, her pronouns. <clears throat> and I'm an instructor at Minneapolis Community and Technical College. Um, I am a white woman with uh, brown hair um, brown eyes. I'm wearing an orange uh, sweater. And in the background um, is a light blue wall with two white doors. Um, I was born uh, with a genetic mutation, um, which uh, results in uh, achondroplasia dwarfism. Um, it's the most common form of dwarfism. Um, and I stand about four feet tall. Um, I meet uh, my disability actually um, kind of um, sparked my interest in science um, because I under it caused me to um, think at a very early age about the implications of the genetic mutation that I carry. Um, I've worked in several wet labs throughout my career, starting in high school, um, college. After college, I was a junior scientist uh, and then went to grad school and now I'm an instructor and I've taught in a number of different wet labs. Getting around labs with high benches and tall stools is difficult. Um, for people with disabilities to access inaccessible spaces, such as labs, um, oftentimes accommodations need to be made in order to provide access. Um, some accommodations I explained in my talk can be in the form of assistive technology which is any sort of device or technology that helps disabled people perform tasks that would otherwise be difficult or impossible to do. In most spaces, I use a step stool to access um, my environment, including counters, lab benches, and equipment. And while uh, accommodations can provide access, they don't provide um, inclusion uh, because they um, uh, because uh, receiving an accommodation, there's a number of barriers um, in order to achieve that. Um, and that often or that needs to happen and begin with self-advocacy. Um, I explained in my, I shared in my talk that self-advocacy was very difficult for me um, because I believe drawing attention to my disability gave people a reason to feel that I was unqualified um, or incapable of, um, you know, succeeding. Um, I also talked about ways that we can make environments more inclusive through universal design. Um, universal design creates spaces and tools that can be used by everyone, not just the average able-bodied user. 
Um, one example that I shared about um, universal design uh, feature that I benefited from was a height adjustable table um, in the lab that I did my PhD thesis work. And this um, universal design feature was very powerful because I no longer needed to use a step stool um, and I didn't need an accommodation in order to receive that access. Um, and so these kinds of, you know, um, this universal design philosophy and method of thinking um, can go a long way in providing other people with disabilities act, access to lab environments. Um, creating accessible spaces isn't the only thing that we need to focus our intention on. Um, I talk a little bit about um, making sure that events are accessible, especially events that are essential for progress within the field. Um, but if our goal is to create an inclusive environment, we also need to um, address some of the negative biases and ableism that prevents people from disabilities from being respected and valued. Um, often people with disabilities are not expected to succeed or not seen as having valuable contributions to make. Um, I shared a story um, from my personal experience about how one of my chemistry instructors in high school thought that I wouldn't do well in his class because of um, because I was a disabled um, student. And that kind of thinking is um, discriminatory and harmful. And thinking back on that experience um, and advice that, or ways I would like to change that kind of thinking um, to be more productive and supportive is instead of, you know, making assumptions about what people can and can't do, ask, how can we ensure that that person is included? Um, what does um, this individual need to succeed? Um, I shared a statistic um, from, a, uh, from a, a journal article from Dr. Sweener et al, who's with us today on the panel, that uh, NIH grant applicants and awardees reporting a disability declined from 1.9% in 2008 to only 1.2% in 2018. Um, for me, that's very concerning. And so it's imperative that we work to create an environment in which um, the STEM field not only supports, but also values people with disabilities and the perspectives that, um, that and creativity and um, you know, influence that they're able to contribute to the field. Um, and so I look forward to the discussions today, um, and I thank the National Academies for um, using this platform to work towards some of the changes that need to be made in the field. Thank you so much. Teresa. So I want to take the opportunity to introduce our other panelist who is joining us today for the structure of the conversation. And um, so that would be Dr. Edelman and Dr. Durstock, and that will be led by Dr. Bonnie Sweener. And Dr. Sweener is a is an associate professor and also in the I Institute at Johns Hopkins and is in the in the School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins. I apologize for the interpreting delay. We also have Dr. Nils Hackinson, who is a professor at the graduate coordinator in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at a state university. So 
Welcome to the conversation. So now I would like to kick it off with some structured questions for the panelists and the planning committee members that we have with us today. For those who are listening to the webcast video, please add your questions and thoughts through the Q&A chat, and we will incorporate your ideas into this conversation from the Slido website. The first question is about the diversity in the lab experience and environment. With accessibility and inclusion, what is a unique perspective that we can use to have implemented by scientists and lab directors using universal design? What would that look like? And what innovative tools can be created to allow for more accessibility in those environments? Who would like to answer this question first? Uh, I'd be happy to take a step. Um, what we find is, um, you know, just uh, in terms of um, uh, being able to get around reconfigurability of the lab environment. Um, right now, you think of most labs you, you had in high school, and the fixtures are really makes it very difficult to get around the height of the lab benches, uh, the narrowness of the spaces in between. Uh, now with height adjustable lab benches with wheels and uh, you know, getting electricity from the ceiling versus, you know, based on the floor, we can really open up a space if we need to um, and really accommodate uh, the movements of a lot of people, whether they're blind or have uh, mobility impairments. And um, also, it really not only allows for greater accessibility for that student, it also opens up communication between the peers. Uh, if I wanted to talk to someone across the room, you know, I would have to navigate around all these stools and uh, lab benches, and it's pretty much impossible. And so, uh, just, just having, having this, this kind of uh, open, open space, space concept, concept really helps. I can add something. So I'm Nils Hackinson. Uh, I'm at Wichita State University. Um, male, 55 years old, um, graying black hair, red hair day, uh, and a blurred background so you don't see my cluttered office. Um, I also have muscular dystrophy and uh, use a wheelchair for mobility, um, limited dexterity. So some of the uh, components of my lab are you know, mostly focused towards wheel mobility or, or mobility limitations because that's what I know. Um, but we have in the past worked with um, schools and um, we would bring in like summer camps essentially high school students and uh, really focused towards uh, kids with disability. Um, one year we worked with Envision, which is a nonprofit group here in Wichita, uh, focused for people who are blind or visually impaired. Uh, we had a number of lab activities in, in our different uh, biomedical labs. Uh, so I run a biomechanics lab. So we use video motion capture, electromyography, which is like electrocardiogram, but for skeletal muscles. Uh, we have force plates, so we do walking studies, jumping, um, rolling is just research we're working on. Uh, and one of the challenges, particularly for uh, participants who are blind or visually impaired, is looking at signals. And that's largely what we do with electromyography is it's a squiggly line on the screen. Um, but we also realized that we could hear it. And so we could take those signals and uh, attach it to an amplifier for and plug in headsets. Now, typically we'll look at multiple muscles uh, when we're looking at some kind of a study. So you have to switch between those different muscles, but that was at least 
one area that we felt that we could be more inclusive and provide somebody some uh, a different perspective. And even for people who are not blind or visually impaired to hear the muscle activity is also kind of an interesting approach. Um, be able to tell if a, a signal deviates in a way that you might not notice if you're just seeing it. Um, I'm Bonnie Sweenor. Uh, I am an associate professor actually at the School of Nursing now, as well as the School of Medicine and Public Health at Johns Hopkins and the founder and director of the Disability Health Research Center here at Hopkins. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I am a white woman with blonde hair in my mid forties. Um, and I just wanna first say, you know, thank you for, for the, having this panel to the National Academies and thank you to Teresa and Brad for their phenomenal keynote um, talks. And I just wanna reiterate that everyone in the audience should take time to listen and watch them. They're impressive and so important. Um, and in adding to this conversation, I also wanted to elevate that the lab spaces are important, but so is the space around them, right? To get to lab, to get to um, where you need to be on a campus or at a research institution matters as well. And that should also be considered universal design of honestly, the entire space is critical. Someone needs to go to lunch, to use the restroom, to go to a conference meeting. Um, and Teresa talked about this beautifully in, in her talk. And so I think we really do need to consider both certainly inside the lab and inside spaces where research is being done, but really it's the whole dimension of a campus and research experience. Fantastic. Yes, thank you for sharing. And I would also like to share what we've been doing at Gallaudet University for how deaf people use the lab spaces so that we can we've been incorporating the concept called deaf space. And that is thinking about color, lighting, and how deaf people can move around to be able to see each other. And some of the results of our work, examples being the lab benches are not black like traditional lab benches, they're actually gray because those are easier on deaf folks' eyes. And we also talk about what lights we use so that it doesn't cause eye strain because we are constantly watching and using our eyes. One of the most fun parts about designing our lab spaces was actually setting up a mock lab in a warehouse and using GoPro cameras to track people's motions. And we realized that a traditional lab design is just not conducive for deaf people. And, and we wouldn't be able to instruct in a traditional setting with a teacher at the front at their own bench because the deaf students wouldn't be able to see the professor. So it's really interesting to see how we use that lab and the intentionality for other people to be able to use that kind of universal design concept as well. Anyone else want to add? Teresa? Well, thank you for sharing your per, uh, perspective, Caroline, um, and others. Um, yeah, I think uh, kind of a big overarching theme is that one size doesn't fit all, um, that adaptability and ways to, um, you know, modify and change the environment to, um, to allow for somebody with a disability to come in and create the space to work well for them. Um, you know, open floor plans and modular um, furniture that can be moved and changed. Um, you know, if there's loud spaces, making sure that there's also quiet environments for people who get um, distracted or um, if noise is a concern. Um, but one of the things that I would like to point out is that a lot of times we focus on kind of how this benefits people with disabilities, but um, both universal design as well as assist, assistive technology can benefit everyone. Um, and a lot of these kinds of things have become uh, commonplace in our environment. Um, 
a lot of technologies that started out as assistive technologies for disabled people um, have become household goods. For example, Siri, um, being able to use your voice to send a text message or audiobooks to be able to listen to um, a book without having to um, read the words, um, as well as text messaging. So um, when we're thinking about creating these spaces um, and putting resources into um, making things accessible, that it benefits everybody, not just disabled people. Thank you. Very well said. And are there any other thoughts or considerations that other panelists want to put forth before we move on to the next question? Okay, so then the next question, here we go. So how do we distinguish between accessibility and inclusion within the lab environment? For example, in your presentation, Nils, we talk about accessibility and the difference between accessibility and inclusion and the intersection between those two things and what conversations need to happen in order for us to have both within a lab environment. Sure, Teresa. Teresa, um, I guess it depends on how you define accessibility and inclusion. Um, the way I like to think about accessibility um, is when um, people can, um, you know, engage in the same activities, um, uh, acquire the same information, and enjoy the same services. As a person without a disability, I think of being able to, you know, go into a space. Um, to be able to communicate with those around me um, and uh, function and work in the space similarly to um, others. Um, I think of uh, inclusion um, as going further, um, not only providing uh, support and access, but also value and respect. Um, uh, inclusion means that people with disabilities uh, have a seat at the table um, we're able to access and participate in the conversation. Our voices are heard. Um, and when we have input and impact in decisions that are um, being made. Um, I think when um, we ask what kinds of conversations need to happen, um, we need to ask ourselves what we value. Um, a lot of times uh, work that is being done focuses on um, productivity, how many hours you're in the lab, how many papers you're publishing, how quickly you're getting your PhD completed, um, rather than valuing kind of the perspective and um, experience and um, significance that a person with a disability can contribute. Um, and asking, um, you know, uh, does their experience matter? Um, can they contribute something um, in a different way if they're not able to um, do the same things that able-bodied people are able to do? And I think in order to do that, we really have to think outside the box. Um, and so I'll, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, this is Bonnie. Um, I completely echo what Teresa just said, um, you know, inclusion is part accessibility, but part addressing the ableism, the negative stereotypes around disability. And you really have to address both to get to a place of inclusion. You know, I very much appreciate this conversation because these ideas are not happening enough in STEM or in higher education. We're not talking about disability enough as part of dimensions of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And when we are, it tends to be solely housed around accessibility and leaves off that component of the culture, the climate, the ableism. And we have to address both to really see change for this community. And I think that's so critical. 
Um, I also just want to elevate in line with what Brad talked about in, in his keynote is we have to change this view that is pervasive in lots of spaces, but feels extremely pervasive, I think, in higher ed and STEM is, um, you know, the future isn't to focus on changing the person, to fix the person, it's to create the inclusive environment. And I, I find often that that message is not being heard or recognized. Um, and I think Brad outlined very eloquently the, the history behind sort of those viewpoints. And so, again, I just reiterate, everyone should, should watch that, his talk. Um, but I think that's where we need to go. We need both components, right? We need anti-ableism and um, uh, universal design. Sorry, I got the uh, uh, snap food here with a bad trackpad. Um, well, and I and I a little bit lost here, so I may be repetitive, and I apologize for that. When I think of accessibility, I do think of the physical environment, um, and it's the facilities and the structure, and the inclusion is more, much more of the social and the understanding that. Um, and I, uh, Bonnie, I think you said this is very really eloquently you know, in bringing people in and recognizing the value. And, um, you know, just even from a perspective of there's something different and being open-minded and, and whether it's a disability or a different culture, a different language, um, a different message on one's t-shirt to be able to say, um, you know, come in and let's work together and, and see what's going on and, and compromise and, and learn from each other, so. Yes, did you want to go ahead and add? Teresa, did you have any additional thoughts or comments there? One thing I wanted to um, kind of, I mean, it's it's kind, it's kind of been mentioned um, in uh, Dr. Durstock's talk, um, but I also want to kind of highlight um, in the STEM field, um, science and medicine especially, oftentimes we, really focus on the medical model of disability in which um, disability is a defect that needs to be fixed um, until we reach what we consider quote unquote normal. Um, and we have to disconnect what we're doing in research and medicine from what we, you know, how we value people um, and um, you know, Dr. Durstock mentioned the social model, um, which, you know, um, in which a disability is viewed as a social construct in the social barriers. Um, but also I want to point out that there's also a model that goes even further, the disability pride model, um, in which disability with a capital D um, is a culture as well as an identity um, that um, we as disabled people hold a lot of pride in. Um, I think my disability um, makes me unique and amazing. And as well as, you know, my family and the other people in the disability community. And um, in order, like, I hope that we can move towards that mindset in which we're celebrating disability. We're not looking at it as a negative thing, but something that makes people with, dis with disabilities amazing and unique and the diversity that they're contributing to society. Yeah, that's great. And uh, Brad, did you have an additional insight there? And I just, um, um, something that uh, Teresa just said about disability, um, uh, and I think I might be preaching to the choir, but, uh, you know, as a cultural um, aspect, disability is so, I, I, I say it's probably the, white, the largest uh, minority we have, affects all genders, affects um, all socioeconomic groups, all races. And um, as someone with a mobility impairment, I don't claim to have any 
uh, great insight on what it's to be deaf or blind. And so it's uh, all these perspectives, you know, helps me, even though I'm part of the disability community, it, uh, it's such a rich um, area that uh, there's always lessons to be learned. So it's, uh, that's all I wanted to add. I want to add to the comments that you guys have made here today that all of us have our own individual stories. Kind of an example of ableism. All of us within the disabled community, we have the prejudice of ableism. That's something that we all have. In the deaf community, we call that autism, in which people who we experience oppression by people who can hear. And um, just another example of ableism, um, you know, I can think of times when I've gone in to give presentations or getting letters of recommendations for students who need job opportunities. And they'll always say things like, um, you know, she's great um, in the lab or things like that, but you know, nothing, I was never given real opportunities for experiments and things like that. And just different examples of ableism and being removed from specific opportunities. And what we need to recognize is that, like you said, people with disabilities provide this unique, diverse experience and something to learn and something that can be contributed to these environments. So, um, yeah, Bonnie. Yeah, this is Bonnie. Thank you for sharing that. You know, I find it striking that, you know, 30 plus years after the ADA and I'll pause to say the ADA is not a fix all for disability inclusion, but has taken us um, to some great advancements. Um, I'm still struck by how pervasive those stories are, you know, similar to what you just shared, particularly in STEM and higher education. You know, I think the bias and the ableism is actually quite profound and um, not always intentional, but still profound, meaning I think it's still so unrecognized <laughs> that it is not okay <laughs> and it's just unknown. You know, I'll share my own personal story that was a critical turning point is um, early in my career, I had a colleague uh, approach me about a project. Um, they didn't know about my disability. I have a visual disability. I have low vision. We met in person. They handed me a piece of paper. I couldn't see it, right? So I disclosed my disability. And the person said, you know, I don't think this is going to work out. I don't understand how you can see your data. I don't think I could ever trust your work if you can't see your data. And, you know, the project went on without me, right? And, you know, I think when I've told that story, people are, are shocked, but there's also sometimes a moment of pause that's sort of like, yeah, how do you do your work, right? And it's that pause that I think is the thing we still have to push on, right? It's that moment of, of, uncertainty by still so many that we have every right to be here and we can do exceptional work, right? And I've said this in other places, it's a radical idea that disabled scientists can be exceptional. That That's still a radical idea. And that's what has to change. All right, yes, absolutely. So we're gonna go ahead and go on to our third question here, which is how can people be proactive about establishing accessible and inclusive environments? And what infrastructure such as tools or cultures do we need to change and touch on for some of this and to include some of our audience and what people in our audience can do about all of this.
This is Nils Hackinson. Um, one of the, and this isn't a direct answer to the question, unfortunately, uh, but one of the challenges that I've experienced and some colleagues have experienced is really getting buy-in from the organization and the university that's kind of responsible for implementing things and maybe spending the extra dollars to to make things accessible and, and universal design. Um, you know, there's, you know, I have a love-hate relationship with that group. I mean, they've done some things which I think are great. And, that, you know, at one point realized that uh, as a postdoc in another university, all the restrooms were either right-handed or left-handed. So all the mail rooms were kind of right-handed as a wheelchair rider, if you wanted to transfer onto the toilet, or if you had a stroke, the, you know, the grab bar was on the right side for the men's restrooms. And then the women's rooms were kind of the mirror of the image of that and realized that, okay, on the alternating floors, you could easily swap it around so that you do have a right-handed restroom for, you know, men and women in the same building. And brought that up to our group and then they implemented that now in all of our new buildings and we're building a lot right now, which is great. But uh, the other side of it is the notion that ADA uh, compliance is accessibility. And the real user component is what makes the difference. And that, that's, again, it's a, a, a wide variety of users and um, making the modifications is, you know, it, there's a lot of resistance and, and often the, the response is, well, it's ADA code, we're good to go. And so I think having enough uh, a critical mass of people say, no, this isn't good. Or, hey, you know what, this is to code, but it's not useful. And so I think that's part of, you know, our goal here is to get enough people with disabilities involved to be able to then have that voice. And my approach has always been to um, work with students. They listen to students more than faculty, which is great. So, This is Bonnie. Um, Nils, I agree completely with everything you said. You know, I would add to that that, you know, we do need institutions of higher ed and, and academic research centers to move from a posture of compliance in this space to one of, you know, promoting disability rights and disability justice, right? And, and, and the pragmatic approaches that Nils just described. Right now in most spaces it is, it's just checking the boxes of legal compliance, if that, <laughs> and um, that's not enough. And that doesn't situate someone for success, quite honestly. The problem is, in my view, is that lots of leaders aren't um, attuned to these issues and there's historical reasons for that. There's gaps in who is in leadership. There's infrequently people with disabilities in leadership positions advising these individuals of the community. So it takes Herculean efforts to champion these causes um, up, to, up to leadership. And that's part of what I think has to change. You know, uh, that really needs to, to be the future is to create a pathway where we have more diverse leadership that also includes people with disabilities in these settings so that we can have really a holistic, more inclusive um, environments. Um, and I think that's important. I'll also add to what Nell said is, is it's important to consider the role of funding uh, funding agencies in this too. Um, you know, funders uh, both can make decisions based on um, sort of what different universities and organizations are doing to promote disability inclusion, as well as to support projects and disabled researchers, right? And in I think there's a lot of opportunity left on the table right now to do this. Um, and I think that's that's a path forward. Yeah, Teresa. 
Yeah, um, I just love the um, kind of uh, richness of this conversation and all the different perspectives that are being contributed. And I think that is a part, like this is a perfect example of how um, we need many people with disabilities to contribute to planning and um, and you know with the question is about being proactive about establishing accessible and inclusive environments like are people with disabilities on the planning committee for buildings that are being built at your institution like let's not wait until after the building is built to realize some of these things i like if you um, access some like one of the most valuable resources that institutions have are the dis disabled people that work and use the spaces around you and you know tap into that resource and ask or invite people to participate in planning committees and not just one disabled person because my disability is the mobility disability. I can tell you, you know, how, you know, the difficult things that are, the things that are difficult for me to access, but I don't have, you know, a visual or hearing impairment. Um, and so it's important to include um, people with um, other disabilities that can provide a unique perspective. Um, you know, and as far as cultural changes that need to be made, um, nobody should be ashamed of acknowledging that they have a disability. Um, and this in my talk is I, what I allude to as being the harder thing to fix. Like, I mean, we're, you know, we're the STEM field, you know, we're curing cancer and we are, you know, rolling out vaccines within a year and we're sending, you know, billionaires out to space. Um, we can, I mean, like I'm starting to get uh, right, energized. We can do this, right? We can build buildings that are accessible if we want to, right? If we want to, um, we can do this, but, um, the, the harder thing to change is making it okay to admit that you have a disability, right? Um, the statistic that I shared that Dr. Spinner published about 1.2% of people reporting a disability. I don't believe that that 1.2% of people with a disability, those are the people that reported it. And there's a number of people that don't report it because there is such a strong negative uh, stigma that's associated with disability. Anyway, we can do this. Okay. This is Rory. I'd like to jump in if I can. Um, this has been a great discussion. What is your What are your thoughts about uh, peer review in science? Um, you know, I think we tell you about nothing without us, about us without us in the disability community, but. I would think that science is an area where actually almost everything is about us without us. And um, I don't think, you know, if we take a page out of the book for women, at least at NIH, they, they, they haven't achieved, I don't think, what they deserve, but at least they've made their voice heard within the leadership, and I don't think we have. So I'd love to see what you think of that. Because part of my thought too is you can't really become a scientist unless you can get a grant and maintain grants. I guess uh, my um, uh, thought on this uh, uh, topic is that um, yeah, I think we're still in the infancy of thinking of how do we accommodate a, a student with disabilities and how, how do we make sure, make sure we are com uh, compliant, compliant and, and this is a group that, that we need to uh, nurture and uh, uh, you know, uh, try, try to, to include. include. But um, yeah, we still have a lot of ways to 
you know, reach the professors that are we want to be have with disabilities and the department heads. And uh, so right now we are just looking at this is a group that needs assistance, uh, more charity. So I think we still have a long ways to incorporate that into STEM careers. And uh, yeah, uh, as a you know, person with disability, uh, being a student with a disability is horrible. But once I could get my own students and my own grants, I could have them do all the things I always wanted to do as a student. And uh, it, it was great. And it's much nicer to be on this end of the spectrum as a professor with a disability than those uh, than trying to struggle, struggle to get to this position. And that's unfortunately uh, the case is now. And when we get to um, medicine, which we haven't really talked too much about, but there's core competencies that really make it impossible for a lot of people to ever even get into medical school. When we have tons of examples of very successful physicians with disabilities, but they sustain their disabilities after they reached, got that MD or uh, DVM or whatever, and they figured, okay, I'm gonna go to radiology or I'll be psychiatry or they found their niche, but a lot of the students aren't afforded those opportunities, uh, unfortunately. Um, to get to uh, an area of uh, success, it's a struggle. It's a long road to home. And uh, um, yeah, it's still, I'm glad not to have to go through that again. Um, this is Bonnie. You know, I want to um, thank before, Teresa. Before you go, um, I think Nils had something oh. to say. My apologies, Nils. I didn't see her. Actually, go ahead. Sorry. No, I'm, I was still digesting what I was going to say. So. Apologies. I don't see hands well on Zoom. Um, uh, so thanks, Teresa, for talking about the, the study we published. Um, and you are exactly right. We believe, too, the, that data of um, the percentage of NH funded researchers with disabilities isn't underreporting. Um, and that's, you know, part of I appreciate you making that point, but that's exactly what we need to change. Um, and um, Rory, to your point, peer review, I, I still struggle with it, admittedly. You know, as a disabled researcher who studies disability equity, I can't even, I've lost count of the number of times I've been told either in journal or on grant reviews that I'm biased because I am studying disability inequities and I myself have a disability. And I just want you to think about what that means, right? It means that one, that someone without a disability is not biased. No, that's wrong. Think about applying that to another group. I don't think we would do that. I hope we wouldn't do that right now, right? That has absolutely prevented me from getting grants, from getting manuscripts accepted in journals, and I'm sure it will continue. And, you know, certainly I'm not going to pretend my science is always spot on or perfect, right? There's, I don't want to pretend that. But I absolutely, as do many of my colleagues, and I'm sure many people on this call, contend with those real issues in peer review. I am public about my disability, right? I'm not hiding it from anyone. I align with what Teresa talked about, you know, with disability pride. I have no shame. I write about it in my bio sketch. Um, so study section knows. Um, yeah, I think it's it's a concern. It's an issue. I have been told that I would have been invited to give a talk, but there was concern that I couldn't travel independently. The list goes on and on. And this stacks up and adds up over time and does have a net impact on an individual's career trajectory, opportunities for promotion. I've certainly felt that, right? This is real, but we don't talk about this. We don't 
think about this in our in institutions, at funding agencies, of how to support the unique barriers to researchers with disabilities. And I think this translates, and I just want to elevate, you know, we're talking a lot about sensory and physical disabilities, but it's people who have chronic conditions, who are immunocompromised, people with mental illness, all included in this space. And when, until we can get more researchers, more faculty with disabilities, who at least are willing to be open, we're going to continue to perpetuate these gaps because the students don't have mentors, right? And we, I, I acutely feel that. Um, and I think that's, that's something we've got to think about, both sides of this equation, the learners and the mentors and the leaders. And uh, I, I just think it's an urgent issue. So Rory, I appreciate you elevating this. This is, I think, an important dimension. Nils, are you ready? Have you fully digested your, your thoughts? Well, it's changed a lot quite a bit. Uh, Bonnie, thank you. That was, uh, I, yeah, well, it's really very moving. I mean, I, I have personally not experienced that, I guess. Um, at least from the peer review side, uh, and I feel kind of ignorant now. Um, I've actually had some fairly positive experiences through the National Science Foundation uh, with a the disability. They, um, uh, there's a group there that uh, has been, I think, very proactive uh, about bringing people with disabilities in. Uh, Ted Conway ran the, uh, what was called the GARD program general and age-related uh, disability research engineering. Uh, uh, yeah, I may have messed it up. Now, now it's DARE, DARE uh, Disability and, and uh, Rehabilitation Engineering Group. group. And uh, I, I think, think that they actually work very proactively to bring somebody with a disability onto the panels uh, so that they have that perspective. Um, my experience there was always very positive and and you know and as an opportunity to in a sense as well guard that not no pun intended um that those fundings are actually being used for the intended purpose of disability related research often you would get people with more biomedical research that we're kind of looking at that because it's a smaller program um, but to say you know well that might be better for the larger group, whereas this is much more of a focused um, opportunity for disability specific work. Um, other sides of things, uh, I'm sorry, my voice, I gotta get some water here. Um, the supplemental funds, and I think that that's a great way for people with disabilities or researchers or uh, to incorporate students with disabilities in research is to, you know, if there is accommodations needed, um, travel companions for conferences, uh, those are, there is funding available for that. And I think it also, not only does it benefit the individuals who will be utilizing that funding, but it also lets the funding agency know that this is a need and that there are people out there who are utilizing this and we are growing our population, so. I'll end there. Good. Thank you so much, Nils. Um, we have some amazing questions coming from the audience. Um, one question is, what are your thoughts on the impact of learning for students with disabilities, especially now relating to lab activities, moving to a more remote environment? How do you feel that transition has specifically impacted students with disabilities? Yeah, Teresa? Yeah, that's a great question. So I've been teaching science labs um, for several years now and um, switched um, from, I was fully teaching fully in person um, before the pandemic and I now teach um, fully online. Um, I've been teaching both asynchronous as well as synchronous labs. Um, I, uh, I think that um, uh, virtual learning has, um, 
you know, pros and cons. Um, there, you know, um, a lot, sometimes um, people with disabilities have difficulties, um, you know, traveling and getting to a campus. And so having a virtual option is great because um, it allows access to some people who otherwise wouldn't um, be able to participate in a lab um, course. Um, however, it's important when doing things online that it's accessible um, for people, um, you know, with, uh, you know, visual or um, hearing disabilities that there's captioning in, you know, videos or, um, and, you know, uh, image descriptions that documents are accessible. Um, so there's a, um, you know, it's important to make sure that uh, online learning is accessible for everybody. Um, one of the things that I did in the lab, a microbiology lab that I was teaching um, with some of my colleagues is that we put together a lab kit um, that we sent home uh, or that we shipped to students so that they could perform experiments at home. Um, and, you know, those kinds of you know, thinking outside the box are things that we can do. So um, I think that there's a lot that we can learn from the pandemic. Um, a lot of people from the dis disability community have been asking for abilities to work remotely um, for a long time. And the pandemic has shown us that that is a very real possibility. Um, in fact, a lot of companies are shifting a lot of their workforce to working from home. Um, and I think that we can also provide that sort of access um, through learning as well, um, but making sure that it's successful. Absolutely. Yeah. And Nils? Uh, I think you meant Bonnie. Oh, yeah. Or Bonnie. Yeah. Bonnie, go ahead. Hi. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I think that it has, you know, I echo what Teresa has said, but I also want to add that it's opened opportunities for the faculty to teach courses to faculty with disabilities, and that's been critical, as well as faculty in lots of situations who are um, providing care for children or other family members. Um, and I think there's been a lot of discussion in the disability community in higher education, but in other spaces. Um, that we we need to hold tight to these gains that we've gotten in this experience during the pandemic of um, remote and virtual learning and work. There's real fear that we may completely move back to um, a model that excludes this option. And for those that had access that they didn't have before and really benefited from this, um, that would be a huge mistake, right? A big miss that would close a door that was opened. And I just want to urge everyone in the audience who may be in opportunities to think about these decisions to think carefully, right? To, as we move forward, hopefully at some point through the pandemic, to recognize that, you know, this has been an interesting natural experiment in lots of ways, but there have been some positives and this is a positive, I think, for lots of people in the disability community, as Teresa outlined, as long as accessibility is prioritized. And to go back to a model where this no longer exists, we'll go back to a situation of exclusion. I think I can add this. I, uh, I, I do see the, definitely the benefit of the online versus in person. Um, the work in my lab is is much more of a physical kind of thing. Um, with the pandemic, we were able to have a smaller group, uh, and you know we sort of divided into smaller groups so that it was uh, kind of fit the university policy of no more than six in a certain size space. Um, but we can also videotape things and and have you know visual experiments and and that certainly only helps the component of the population. Um, we did not in my current situation 
uh, have a need for like a closed captioning or a descriptive audio, um, but that certainly could be something that could be done as well, I think. Um, and as Bonnie said, this, you know, the, the hybrid approach or the virtual environments really do provide, I think, you know, for me as a faculty member with a disability, an opportunity to, you know, if I'm not feeling well or if I've got three different things going on that I can't get across campus to the classroom or if it's a really bad weather day that I don't want to sit out in the cold, wait for a bus or take the risk of driving on my own, I can zoom in and we can have our lecture and uh, uh, maybe not the lab activity, but at least certainly the communication and um, maybe pursue other options. Uh, you know, there are other, we, we did a workshop with uh, a larger group uh, this earlier last year and worked with some of the assistive technology providers. And, you know, they've really stressed the benefit of having a option for somebody who may need to recline every 20 minutes that you can't necessarily do that very easily in the office. Or if you, you know, um, you know, want to have the ability to, I mean, have a meeting like we're having right now. This would not necessarily be possible uh, to the extent in that we'd have 200 people all congregate in, you know, Washington or Kansas City or something like that. So this benefit, I think, well, you know, it does certainly make it a lot easier for me. Um, and I'm sure for others who are, you know, participating can see the advantages and we did hear locally that, you know, a group of engineers and one of the aircraft manufacturing uh, companies, uh, the manager is saying that they're more productive now that they're working at home. And um, so hopefully companies will see the value of it as well and uh, work to maintain it. Great, yeah, and Teresa, you got a comment? I just wanted to kind of plug in there in my talk I mentioned, um, being able to access uh, um, meetings, scientific meetings uh, virtually um, has been amazing. Um, and for people who with disabilities who have difficulties traveling, um, allowing for that to be an option to be able to participate um, virtually have access to you know posters and presentations and um, you know panel discussions is is a, it was is great I mean um, and I think that you know I would hate like uh, Bonnie has said I would hate to see these kinds of opportunities disappear when we you know go back to quote unquote normal Thank you so much, Teresa. And I just wanted to add to that, as far as deaf students who have been learning remotely, um, we've actually seen a decrease in the number of students enrolling in our lab courses. Um, you know, we'll see everyone, you know, as far as, which has kind of been interesting because in Zoom, we'll have like six students, you know, and we can actually see each other more clearly in that kind of a way. Um, so we've just been trying to navigate, you know, doing Zoom and sending the lab links, you know, to students, to, you know, decreasing the size of our classes has really been an accommodation to be able to help students learn virtually, to just have less visual stimulation going on. And then for virtual meetings, we actually, myself, I actually prefer the virtual meetings because it's very fine, hard to find interpreters who specialize in the field of STEM. But now with virtual options, that opens it up to any interpreter in the entire country. So now I can have an interpreter who specializes in the field of STEM who might be in another state, but is able to join virtually and provide that, you know, more technical support um, and is knowledgeable of our field. Um, and we're also, you know, able to have more of those water cooler conversations that I can participate in in the chat and things like that, that I just, I am not normally privy to in in-person conversations or with in-person conferences. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to add that. I did want to go ahead and add one more question for the audience which is, what is your thoughts on the inclusion of data? 
accessibility of uh, accessibility of data. Bonnie, yeah, please go ahead. Oh, I think Brad was first. Go ahead, Brad. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a great question because we're seeing data as being so integral in um, how we um, discuss findings, how we uh, interpret findings. Uh, you know, data science is the term was really not a thing uh, not too long ago. And so now everything is really a lot of data science. And um, yeah, I, I, I think how we uh, interpret data, how we capture data, I really, really need to look at that. Um, I made a comment that we've been so visual centric in our science data for so long that how much are we missing? Because we're just looking at um, uh, data in terms of collection uh, from a visual aspect um, modality. Uh, but then of course, when it comes to access, how do we present that data? And uh, I don't know if I have great answers to those solutions, um, but uh, we definitely need to reevaluate that. Note taking has long been a, a problem with a lot of people with disabilities. And uh, how do we collect that data? I think there's new technologies out there that allow us to collect it in digital forms and process it in different ways. And so I, I find that very exciting. Um, you know, in the classroom, you can record the classroom uh, conversations. But uh, yeah, I see that really as a, a new frontier in accessibility is how do we get information. Yes, go ahead, Bonnie. Yeah, this is Bonnie. Thank you. As um, someone with a visual disability and an epidemiologist who thinks about data far too much, this is a, a great question. So thank you for whoever asked it. Um, data accessibility is a pervasive problem and it's not just about researchers and trainees. I think it's a uh, concern for the general public. And I think that's been played out during the pandemic. Um, you know. Uh, as I work with students and through my own career, it's the software to analyze data that isn't always accessible, right? The tools, <laughs> the data collection components and tools aren't always accessible. And think about what that means both for the researchers with disabilities and the inclusion of people in collecting data from people with disabilities um, who may be preferentially excluded then. Um, and then, um, as Brad said, then when you're sharing data, it tends to be a visual exercise. And um, you can miss a lot of information when that's not made accessible with alt text and universal design practices. Um, journals do not adopt this mostly, and that's a challenge for, for folks like me who have a visual disability and many other types of disabilities. And, getting content that's critical again for your career success and, and understanding your field. Um, but I also argue that it's critical for our job as researchers to work with the public and you know our, our goal shouldn't just be to um, publish in scientific articles and speak at conferences but to sort of go beyond that and have impact in the world. Um, I believe in removing barriers to data to remove data gatekeeping and accessibility is critical to that. Um, so, you know, in the pandemic, there was a lot of information and continues to be coming out very fast. You know, think of the curves, the, the pandemic curves. They're not always very accessible, yet people use those to make decisions personal and family and, you know, otherwise. And if you don't have that content or that information, it's, it's you're kind of left behind. It's a challenge. So I think this idea of, again, universal design, inclusion and accessibility has to be everywhere. And data really is critical. Data is, is part of this component, both for the researcher side, but also for the general public. 
Wow, Bonnie, that is very well said. And it's a very interesting perspective because we talk, in my perspective, I think more about the audio portions of it and software translations from audio to visual. So it's interesting to hear about your perspective for the opposite, talking about how to make visual things more audio accessible and showing data in different ways so that we can learn something new. Um, For example, if something listens to something, someone listens to something and then maybe they see something differently, where is the disconnect there? Is the disconnect in the audio information or the visual information? And so that's something that we can take advantage of. So we have six minutes remaining. So I will ask one final question. Let me pull it up here. Okay, so one of the chat questions, is it possible to speak to how we can have more students involved, uh, students with disabilities involved with science and lab careers? Nels? Yeah, thank you. Um, there's, let me get rid of the hand here. Um, uh, yeah, there have been several programs over the years that have worked specifically on this. Uh, AAAS had the entry point, um, which was actually recruiting people uh, with disabilities in high school and bringing them through the, sort of the STEM pipeline and and really focusing on um, internships in government agencies. So NASA, for instance, was one. Um, I actually learned about it as a grad student. Uh, I somehow um, missed the boat, uh, seemed to do that a lot too much, but uh, it, it was a great opportunity, I think, for people, for the government organizations to really channel uh, oper- or develop opportunities and to work with students with disabilities to show uh, opportunity, well, uh, potential placement. And then, you know, also to see people move into those jobs, we would sort of create this occur, a reoccurring system. Um, there's, I think, a lot of funding through the National Science Foundation, um, the INCLUDES grants, the ADVANCE grants. Um, so I'm happy to see that and I'd like to see more. Well, stop there. Great. And Teresa, we'll go ahead and have you close out our comments and then we'll have our final wrap up for today. Yeah. Um, oh, wow. That's a big load to carry. <laughs> um, I guess. Um, what I, I like mentorship programs are really great um, because they can connect people, uh, students with disabilities to mentors with disabilities who have you know, maybe experienced the same thing or somebody to reach out and connect with if you're you know, um, encountering some barrier that you're struggling with. I think looking back on my career, it would have been really helpful if I had a mentor that um, was disabled and that I could receive support um, from that end. Um, I'm, you know, uh, OPI and the um, scholarships and STEM mentorship program. Um, and one of the things I've learned um, through that program is how important it is to have many mentors, not just a research mentor, but also somebody, you know, that maybe can relate to one of your identities that you hold. Um, but another thing I want to point out is that this work shouldn't just rest on the shoulders of people with disabilities. Like you shouldn't just wait for somebody with a disability to start a mentorship program. Um, you know, learn about you know opportunities or you know uh, people who don't have disabilities and faculty and um, you know PIs like bring awareness of, um, to disability to your campus. Just talking about it is huge um, because 
Like it makes you not feel like nobody notices that you're disabled. I mean, there were never conversations um, throughout my career about disability um, and just everybody, you know, pay attention to disability and include it in your conversation. Thank you, Teresa. I am afraid we have to end our conversation. And wow, what an excellent conversation today, touching on so many different topics, covering lab accessibility, inclusion and environment, and not just in the STEM career fields, but in a broader sense, the benefits of disabilities to the STEM workplace, and also how we can provide good virtual experiences for students with disabilities. And lastly, how we need to encourage more students to get into STEM fields so that we can develop more of those mentorship programs because many of us are now leading those programs because of our experience. So, this is the second of five conversations in this series. So our next conversation will take place on Thursday, February 10th from 10.30 a.m. to noon. And we'll focus specifically on recommendations to improve accessibility and inclusion in the context of field work. And as a researcher myself and a field worker myself, I'm very much eager to be a part of that conversation and to um, for that conversation to take place. So thank you all for joining us. And more information about our next series will be posted on the series website on Slido. And this webcast, again, will be recorded and posted on Slido as well. That holds true for the remainder of our series as well. Those series will be recorded for your pleasure viewing at a later time if necessary. So thank you again for the wonderful conversation from you guys as panelists and for everybody that was able to join us today. Thank you so much. All clear, thanks. Great work, folks. Excellent conversation today.